Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. What's up, guys? Um, and girls now, I guess. I had like 1%, uh, uh, like I had like 99%, um, male audience for a long time. I can see it in my uh, statistics. Obviously, when you create a YouTube channel, I'm like, how do they know that? But I'm like, uh, when you create a YouTube channel, they ask, you know, your gender. So I guess that, uh, is how they get the, the uh, statistics. So it's up to like 6%. Female and like 94% male. So, wow. Uh, less of a boys club. But uh, let's... Uh, I lost track. What am I doing? All right, Napoleonic Wars, part five. I was confused for a second. Um, because he accidentally... No knock against Epic History TV, my favorite channel. But he uses part five twice. Uh, so I was a little bit confused. Where is it? Right here. May so, part five, Napoleon's Revenge. This is actually part six. Uh, I was confused because I'm like, all right, if there are six parts, then the sixth part is going to be very small. But he accidentally uses Ro Roman numeral five for the sixth part. The real part five. A war on two fronts right here that would challenge his empire like never before right so spain didn't end up great for napoleon uh i knew very little about you know spain and i knew very little about spanish history in general and portuguese history but um spain put up real resistance um did a really good job uh repelling uh, napoleon as much as uh they could napoleon ended up having to go in and do stuff himself and he was more successful but, uh, yeah, let's go. Let's go. I'm ready. Napoleon had blunt. Original link to the video down in the top description below. Like always, I'd recommend checking it. I'm talking so fast. I'm just excited. I'm, uh, I would recommend checking the first four parts out. Uh, either my reactions to them or straight from the channel. Let's go. In Spain. But it was years before the scale of his mistake was evident. Then he would say, I embarked pretty badly on this affair. I admit it. The immorality showed too obviously. The injustice was too cynical. The whole of it remains very ugly. Just, I, I don't wanna. Austria fights back. In 1809, France under Napoleon Bonaparte was the most powerful nation in Europe. But the French Emperor's invasion of Spain and Portugal the previous year had failed to deliver the easy victory he'd expected. And with many of Napoleon's best troops and commanders, Sorry, guys. Spain's powerful nation in Europe. But the French Emperor's invasion of Spain and Portugal the previous year had failed to deliver the easy victory he'd expected. And with many of Napoleon's best troops and commanders now tied down in Spain, an old enemy prepared to challenge France once more. Austria had been... Austria had been preparing for war with France since her last... All these, like, subtle passive-aggressive... Very emphasis on the aggressive statements are just kind of scary. Humiliating defeat at Austerlitz in 1805. Now, with Napoleon I busy in Austerlitz, preparing for war with France since her last humiliating... Austria had been... Okay, sorry. ...in 1805. Now, with Napoleon busy in Spain and a British promise of cash subsidies, plus a supporting attack in Northern Europe, it looked like the ideal time to strike. This time, Austria's armies would be led by Archduke Charles, Emperor Francis's younger brother. At 37, he was two years younger than Napoleon, but already had 15 years' experience of high command. And he was learning from past defeats. He'd begun to reform the Austrian army along French lines, copying Napoleon's corps system and introducing new infantry tactics. Napoleon, warned by his spies that Austria was preparing for war, left Spain. I love how Spain is like 
half blue fading into red, half red. Spain ...and raced back to Paris, arriving on the 24th of January, 1809. The French army in Germany, commanded by Marshal Berthier, would need urgent reinforcement. So Napoleon summoned units from Spain, called up young conscripts, and soldiers from his German allies in the Confederation of the Rhine. I just want to say this, right? I'm not going to apologize this time for pausing because I really want to say it. Tough, all right? Uh, this seems like a, I'm going to compare it to, again, the Axis powers in World War II just because I guess I'm familiar with that and most comfortable with uh, creating a somewhat accurate and non-laughable analogy. But I guess I can use really any drawn-out war. Now, World War II is a good one where even when, it, you know, everything's going well and... You know, you're conquering all these places that, uh, you know, so incredibly fast, blitzkrieging, and uh, you think you're invincible, and then one kind of blunder happens, and then other nations notice that, and then they seize that, and then everything can start turning that way, and, and it's just so hard when you have enemies on every side, and you can't knock out. Like, Britain is such a pain to anyone trying to conquer Europe. Like, uh, it's just... The, the channel's there. They have such a good Navy. And they're always going to be, like, that standout, like, no, we're not surrendering, and no, you can't really attack us, you know? And, um, yeah, eventually it just always seems like one mistake happens, and everyone gets kind of, like, motivated because they see uh, Napoleon make a mistake, and they start, you know, reinvigorating. Grande Armée was no longer the finely honed instrument of 1805. But with Napoleon at its head... It was still a formidable force. Archduke Charles ordered diversionary attacks in Poland and northern Italy, but launched his main attack against France's ally, Bavaria, on the 10th of April. It came a week earlier than Napoleon had expected and caught the French Emperor by surprise. Charles was relying on a rapid advance, but a last-minute change of plans, torrential rain, and a slow-moving baggage train slowed progress to a crawl. Why are there two women? Marshal Berthier was a brilliant chief of staff to Napoleon, but an indecisive field commander. His forces were too widely dispersed, Obviously, yes, and Marshal Davout's third corps was dangerously isolated at Regensburg. Charles ordered his corps to converge and destroy it. But on the 17th of April, Napoleon arrived at Donauwert to take over command. He immediately ordered... Again, this is why this channel is so great. You can just feel like they ramp up the music and everything just starts to feel more intense, like you're on a roller coaster. Davu to withdraw from his exposed position. It was too late for him to escape without a fight. Davout's third corps was one of the best in the Grand Armée, and in a fast-moving battle across wooded hills, the heroes of Auerstadt threw back the Austrians. Despite the heroism of General Major Liechtenstein, badly wounded, leading his troops forward, the third corps escaped the encirclement. The Battle of Teugenhausen was the start of Napoleon's so-called four-day campaign. First, he used Marshal Lefebvre's Bavarian 7th Corps and a provisional corps under Marshal Lann to drive a wedge into the Austrian army. Then he pursued its left wing towards Landshut, believing he was following the main Austrian army. French troops and their German allies stormed the town's bridge to win a hard-fought victory. But Napoleon realized that Archduke Charles was not at Landshut, and that, once again, he'd left Marshal Davout to face the main enemy force. Sending Marshal Bessières in pursuit of the Austrian left wing, Napoleon swung north, falling on the Austrian 4th Corps at Eckmühl. French and their German allies won their fourth victory in as many days. But Charles's main force was still intact, and hoping to keep it so, he ordered a rapid retreat across the Danube. The French pursued, storming the walled city of Regensburg, which they knew as Ratisbon. Is that the elite guard? Is, is 
is that what this is right here that see how this is like the blue and white checkered with that seal in the middle compared Dude, storming the walled city of Regensburg, which they knew as Ratisbon, with its vital stone bridge. Napoleon put Marshal Lann in charge of the assault. When the attack faltered, Lann threatened to lead the next charge in person, and his men, suitably chastised, took the city. During the siege, Napoleon was hit in the foot by a spent bullet, causing widespread alarm. But it proved to be a superficial... Hey, his hand's not in his... In his uh you know, the unbuttoned part of his shirt. Like wound. Spread alarm, but it proved to be a superficial wound. Stubborn Austrian resistance had allowed Archduke wound. Charles and his army to escape across the Danube. Napoleon had cut the Austrian army in half. Such an idiot. Austrian resistance. I'm so sorry, guys, for all these friggin' ADD rewinding. I just, I really don't want to go forward unless I know what I just heard. ...had allowed Arch... ...wound. Stubborn Austrian resistance had allowed Archduke Charles and his army to escape across the Danube. Napoleon had cut the Austrian army in half, but both sections now retreated in good order towards Vienna. Napoleon led his forces in pursuit, detaching Lefebvre's Bavarian corps to deal with a popular revolt in... Do they have time when they're crossing the rivers to, uh, I'm assuming there's a bridge there, to destroy the bridge? Maybe it's, um, maybe they're coming too fast. ...and 3rd Corps and the Württemberg 8th Corps to guard his line of communications. Charles chose not to defend the capital, which surrendered on the 13th of May after a short bombardment. Instead, Charles and the Austrian army lay in wait across the Danube. Napoleon was now down to 80,000 men, facing 110,000 Austrians. Charles's army had fought bravely and well throughout the campaign. But Napoleon's it's strange in the beginning of the series I was kind of rooting for Napoleon and now I'm like rooting against him. still had a low opinion of Austrian troops I, I know the outcome obviously and decided not, not of these specific wars but of you know the whole thing to attack throughout the campaign but Napoleon still had a low opinion of Austrian troops and decided to attack as you were rewinding so much it's like of the 20th of May, French engineers hastily built a series of floating bridges between the river islands of the Danube, and French troops began to cross. By noon the next day, Napoleon had most of Massena's 4th Corps and his cavalry across the river. About 24,000 men and 40 guns, holding the villages of Aspern and Essling. Napoleon expected the Austrians to retreat once more, and that he'd only face a rear guard. But reports soon arrived that the entire Austrian army was... I love that positioning, because... I mean, the, those are temporary bridges, makeshift bridges that they built quickly that they can... Uh, uh, so that they can get across. And now he's sitting in an area with kind of bogged down or in, setting up in an area where you have these two towns here for kind of coverage and buildings for whatever you need, planning or medical or whatever. And if you have to retreat, the only way that, that they can come, you know, you can, I hope you can see my cursor, like you can set up kind of perimeter here. You can always escape. And then, like I said before with, you know, Maybe you couldn't, if there's like a well-built bridge, uh, destroy it in time of for a retreat for your pursuers to not be able to get across the bridge. The makeshift bridges, I'm sure, if they're overwhelmed, they can escape back that way and then quickly destroy the bridges. So that's a good uh, kind of uh, choice of location. But reports soon arrived that the entire Austrian army was advancing against him in five attack columns, 90,000 men, and 300 cannon. The situation got even worse. 
the Austrians began to float heavy barges and obstacles downriver to smash through the flimsy French bridge. Each bus and 300 cannon. The situation got even worse. The Austrians began to float heavy barges and obstacles downriver to smash through the flimsy. So he knew about that. Obviously, how could they be over there? Oh, that is genius. That is genius. So just set just set up, you know, you know it's gonna flow down a river. Um, I'm assuming that's the way the river flows. There's no way they had a propeller or anything. Um uh, so you can't blame Napoleon there. It's not like he can choose to make the river flow the other way. Just make it super heavy so that when it comes in contact with the bridge, it just destroys it. And that not only cuts off uh, the, supplying, the, supplyman of, uh, the supply of more reserve troops, but makes it much harder to retreat as well. So that kind of... The French bridge. Each time, Napoleon's only supply route was cut off for several hours, causing critical delays to the arrival of reinforcements and ammunition. The battle began around 2.45 p.m. as infantry of the Austrian first column attacked Aspern. This is my favorite part the of village was soon under attack from three sides. General Molitor's French garrison clung on desperately, fighting hand-to-hand -hand in the streets and suffering 50% casualties. To support the defenders of Aspern, Napoleon ordered cavalry to charge the Austrian third column. It seems like you're so but they could not break through the Austrian infantry, closed up in their battalion mass formation. At 6 p.m., Archduke Charles mass formation. That's so cool. Look at that. That's so cool. That's so cool. What about from cannons, though, or from... Why, why are they charging in... What? Dang, all this in hindsight. But, uh, so they have... It looks like one, two, three, four. Obviously, the painter could add... It seems like four lines on each side, maybe three. Um, I don't know how accurate the painting is. I'm assuming it's pretty accurate. Uh, so you have that kind of volley fire of, you know, you, you can only fire so many shots per minute. You shoot, second line shoots, third line shoots, fourth line shoots. By that time, the first is reloaded and repeat, and you have it on each side. I'm, and then you got a general up top or whatever, or whoever this guy is, not up top, but in the middle on a horse who can see over them and kind of tell them what to do. I, I, they might even have them on four sides. But, uh, yeah, that's cool. At 6 p.m., Archduke Charles ordered General Bellegarde's second column to take Aspern at any cost. Charles himself Attaboy. rode among the front ranks, urging the men forward. In ferocious fighting, the Austrians took the village. Napoleon immediately sent in newly arrived reinforcements to recapture it. I don't think... Oh About the God. same time, the Austrian 4th Column began its attack and on the fifth. village of Essling, where Marshal Lann had taken charge of... Ooh, the 5th should go around and try and... or should, like, scoot through here and, like, knock out the other bridges or... ...defenses while he waited for his own... This is such a good channel! ...the Marshal Lann had taken charge of defenses... Seriously, he whoever was the first one to recommend this one... I owe you one. Maybe I don't, you just, I just, if you were, just let me know. Maybe I'll find out. For his own corps to cross the you have given me my new favorite channel. While he waited for none. his own corps to cross the Danube. The first Austrian assault was repulsed. Sorry. Same time, the Austrian fourth column began its attack on the village of Essling, where Marshal Lann had taken charge of defenses while he waited for his own corps to cross the Danube. The first Austrian assault was repulsed. The veteran French cavalry commander, General Despagne, led his cuirassiers in pursuit, but was hit by grape shot and died of his wounds. 
By what? But was hit by grape shot and died of his wounds. Around 9 p.m., the Austrian 5th Column finally arrived in position and made its first attack against Essling, which was thrown back by Land's troops. The fact that they're not retreating yet and Napoleon As night fell, firing died out across the battlefield, Pretty, uh, and men got what rest they could among the dead and the wounded. I was about to be pissed. I thought that was the end of the part. Overnight, 2nd Corps and the Imperial Guard crossed the Danube to reinforce Napoleon's army, which now numbered 71,000 and 150 guns. But then the bridge broke again, leaving Davout's 3rd Corps still waiting like, to you, you don't need light to, to make more of those barges and put them into the river. Like, what? There's something I don't know. I, I, I know it's not so easy. You know, darkness has a much greater effect on the battlefield when uh, you don't have, you know, electricity or whatnot, and you have to rely on fires. But, I mean, you could, you could keep sending those barges so they can't get reinforced. It seems like they had them. If these were accurate depictions of how many troops they had compared to these guys, I, I just... I now numbered 71,000 and 150 guns. But then the bridge broke again, leaving Davout's 3rd Corps still waiting to cross. Nevertheless, Napoleon decided to attack, using 2nd Corps to break the Austrian center. But first, Aspern would have to be retaken. Heavy fighting broke out in the village before dawn. By 7 a.m., it was back in French hands. Here, At Essling, fresh Austrian attacks were for- If he comes out, obviously he's going to come out alive. He doesn't die here, but I'm not sure how this battle turns out. It seemed to be a clear win where, where Napoleon was going to retreat. Um, if he ends up pulling this off and staying there the whole time and winning this battle, he is just a god. Caught off by General LaSalle's cavalry and units of the Young Guard. With both flanks secure, Napoleon launched his main attack in the center with Land's Second Corps. Austrian guns poured fire into the advancing French ranks. General Saint-Hilaire, leading the attack, a hero of Austerlitz and Jena, had his foot blown off, a wound that proved fatal. Archduke Charles sent his grenadier reserve forward to strengthen the line. The French infantry, under torrential fire, began to fall back. Yes. At this why, critical why moment, the French have... bridge over the Danube was broken again. There we go. Halting the vital flow of reinforcements and ammunition to Napoleon's army. By 2 p.m., the French had been driven out of Aspern once more. I feel like I'm going to get a bunch of angry French people in the comments being like, well, a few decades ago, we just helped you win against the British and gain your independence. I know all that. I'm just, I'm just, I don't know why. I'm just at this point when someone's winning. It's like you have a basketball team. A lot of you guys aren't American. A soccer team, a football team who like always wins every time. Like, and he keeps winning. Eventually, like, you kind of root for them to lose. Heavy fighting continued in Essling, which was briefly captured by the Austrians, then retaken by the Young Guard. Napoleon knew his army could do no more. At 4 p.m., he ordered his exhausted cavalry to make a last charge to keep the enemy at bay, then gave the order to retreat. Hey. Archduke Charles, After all that, whose no own shame. army had suffered huge losses and was low on ammunition, was content to watch the French withdraw to the island of Lobau. Good job, Charles. In the final moments of the battle, Marshal Lannes, one of Napoleon's finest commanders and closest friends, was hit by a cannonball that smashed both his legs. He died of his wounds a week later. It was a deep blow to the Emperor. What is it with um, another question for you guys? Maybe I should just write this down in the comments. I'm just gonna ask it anyway. Is um, 
What a loss for France and for Napoleon on the day. Marshal Lanay. What was I going to say? Oh, yeah, of, of the point where, like, top generals and important military men, I guess it was a sort of, like, pride and, like, showing your troops you're there. They, they knew the importance of making sure these p people don't die, and you just don't have the communication you have today. So generals and higher-ups in more recent conflicts, like World War I, World War II, and onward, they don't have to be there commanding them. I, I guess that I guess I just answered my own question. Um, you know, you don't have these lines of communication that are reliable, so it's hard to command your troops. And maybe there was a sort of like, hey, we're in this with you too. But uh, I mean, you want to keep your generals safe. I think I answered my own question. The two-day battle of Aspern. Meaning like, how are you going to direct your troops if you're not, able to communicate Essling. the two-day battle of aspern essling was napoleon's first major defeat caused by his overconfidence and hasty planning both sides suffered heavy losses and napoleon avoided a much greater disaster only because of the exhaustion of the austrian army the french emperor had learned new respect for the austrians under Archduke Charles, they had fought bravely, respect of the exhaustion of the Austrian army. The French Emperor had learned new respect for the Austrians. Under Archduke Charles, they had fought bravely, with greater confidence, organization, and leadership. Within days of his defeat, Napoleon had summoned reinforcements to join him on the Danube, and begun planning his revenge. That went by so fast. How long was that? It was about as wow. Um, great one. Yes, he says part five again. Napoleon's revenge. Wagram or Vagram, 1809. Such a great channel, like a roller coaster, awesome. Um, I'm gonna do the next step. So I think 1917, I did the Battle of the Somme. Uh, so uh, last time, so I'll do the uh, 1917 episode. Uh, I think that's when the Americans get in World War One. Bit late as usual. Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, keep an eye out for that. Hit that bell, hit the bell icon so you can see when my next video comes out. Go check out Epic History, great channel, my favorite channel. See you guys next time. Have a good one.